Well, I see that the time is 7 p.m. So uh, I welcome those of you who are attending at this time. And I think I'll go ahead and, and begin the program by sharing my screen. And I'd like to thank the uh, friends of the Granby uh, Free Public Library for co-sponsoring this event. And the Granby Community Access and Media will also be recording a present, this uh, a broadcasting a present, uh, a recording of this presentation. And I'd also like to thank, thank the uh, Granby Cultural Council for funding the event. Uh, we acknowledge that we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map and honor those whose land we now occupy. Uh, so what are beneficials? The, the beneficials in the title of this program refer to those organisms that help farmers and gardeners grow the food and other crops that we need. Uh, so beneficials include pollinators, predators, and parasites, the three Ps. And pollination is essential for genetic diversity. Uh, if it wasn't for pollinators uh, bringing pollen from one plant to another, um, the, uh, every seed would be identical, every plant would be identical to its parents. Uh, the pollinators do this uh, inadvertently. They, uh, they're simply attracted to the nectar and pollen they collect and then uh, just happen to bring uh, uh, pollen from one flower to the next. And flowers um, attract pollinators uh, uh, by visual cues and, and uh, they uh, flowers might seem uh, like a one solid color to us, but because they see ultraviolet light, both birds and insect insects see UV light, uh, they might see a pattern. Uh, <clears throat> just like <clears throat> just like us, they uh, can smell flowers, but they smell them probably a lot better than we do. Uh, and there are electrical charges on flowers. There was a recent experiment that demonstrated that flowers are slightly negatively charged and that uh, bees and other pollinators are attracted to them. And because the bees are themselves positively charged, they're able to pick up pollen all the better. Uh, and uh, remarkably, some flowers signal to pollinators that they've already been visited and uh, Guide uh, and giving the, the visual cues to those pollinators to visit to visit flowers that uh, still do have nectar rewards for them, and you can see in the photo on the left uh, the lupin flowers with the red tinged petals um, are the ones that have already been visited and the pollinators will avoid. On the right, you'll see a monkey flower with a pistil open and in a receptive position, and then on the uh, on the second photo, it's closed. And that too is a visual signal to pollinators. Uh, so uh, here's a typical poster of, uh, of the different pollinators that uh, are out there. Uh, we don't have any uh, bats pollinating flowers here in New England, but we do certainly have bees, butterflies, and the uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, those are the most charismatic of the pollinators, but we also have moths, wasps, flies, and beetles, which have their roles to play. 80% of all plants need pollinators to set seed. The other 20% are wind pollinated. So if it wasn't for plants, uh, vast majority of, uh, if it wasn't for pollinators, the vast majority of plants out there uh, would not be able to set seed. One third of our food is also pollinated. And you can see in this slide how much of a difference pollinators make. The, the strawberry in the middle received no pollen from any other flower. The one on the right, was able to manage somehow to get uh, some windborne pollen, which is uh, somewhat remarkable actually that uh, the, uh, 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 an insect pollinated flower uh, would still have uh, pollen floating in the wind. Uh, but the one on the left certainly is uh, uh, much more of a, a fruit of harvestable fruit. It, it was an open pollinated flower. So, uh, so birds are um, beneficial organisms because they, are both predators and pollinators. Uh, they are great at pest control. Um, and in addition, they disperse seeds uh, and help plants to spread their, in their uh, territories. Uh, the only two uh, birds that I'm aware of that pollinate flowers are the ruby-throated hummingbird and the Baltimore Oriole. Bird populations have declined by, alarmingly by 30% uh, in the past half century and will continue to decline uh, 
another by another a third or so um, if uh, human um, impacts on the environment continue to be as uh, devastating as they have been. So, uh, and it's not just the numbers of birds, but the diversity, the number of different species, the variety of, of birds uh, are declining at, along with all other species of vertebrates and invertebrates for that matter. Uh, so um, when we think about bird conservation, first we have to uh, think do no harm. And uh, one harm that uh, our buildings uh, or one hazard that we, our buildings pose to birds is that they perceive our windows as reflections and as part as a continuation of their territory, the out of doors that they can uh, apparently fly in that direction. But of course, if they do, um, they, they meet an immovable object. A, a billion birds in the US are killed every year due to window collisions. And we can do something about it. Um, abcbirds.org is a website that has information about how to avoid, uh, how to make it apparent to birds that uh, windows are not, in fact, uh, a safe place to fly to. Uh, cats kill up to 3.7 billion birds in the US every year. That's both feral and house cats. So we need to keep our cats indoors and perhaps uh, an, an extra uh, motivation to do so is an awareness that there are wild animals that are capable of taking out a cat. In addition, uh, other, other cats and dogs can be uh, outside and, and can pose a hazard to house cats. Uh, habitat loss uh, is due to industrial agriculture, residential development and commercial development. There, there simply are not nearly not as many places as there used to be for animals to live and, that, and, and the plants that they depend on. And that has had a huge impact on birds. So has climate change. Um, the impacts include habitat loss itself, um, new pests and diseases, disruptions and timing of migration, reproduction, breeding, nesting, and hatching, and uh, the possibility that bird behavior will no longer be in sync with their food sources and other habitat needs. So one thing we can do uh, to help uh, our, our environment is simply to buy less. Uh, this graph shows uh, how many, uh, uh, the, in red, you'll see provision of goods, 29%, provision of food, 13%. So it's uh, uh, food and non-food items are in total 42% of our individual um, carbon footprint. And every day we make decisions about what we purchase and perhaps we can give some uh, second thought to uh, what those uh, impacts are of those products that we're buying. And, and by doing so, we can uh, save money. A, a, fru a, a frugality can include uh, just buying something secondhand or, or, or doing without it or uh, you know, whatever makes sense. Um, and, and we can help the wildlife at the same time. Bird watching helps to connect us to nature and helps us to have a, a less materialistic lifestyle. And you'll see at the bottom of the page, uh, Masters Bird Clubs uh, are uh, the massbird.org. And uh, it, uh, for those of you in Granby, uh, there is uh, the Hampshire Bird Club in Amherst that uh, has, uh, has a long history of uh, bringing birders together. And they do have uh, virtual programs, uh, so you can uh, check them out if you like. <clears throat> so birds are um, uh, uplifting to our spirits. We watch them, uh, the, the miracle of flight, uh, and uh, the delight of hearing them sing. Uh, we are inspired by their devotion to each other and to their offspring. And uh, so in, in providing for their needs, uh, we, we remind ourselves what those needs are, food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young, which are the same basic needs that all, <clears throat> that all animals have. Um, but we should be aware that feeding the birds does not include uh, process, processed baked goods or other junk food. Uh, and if they contain preservatives, salt, sugar, and refined flour, we're not doing them any favors. Uh, and they're empty calories because there's so little protein and they lack fat. Um, this is true of almost all baked products. And here's the consequence. Uh, this, uh, this goose that was fed too much, too much processed baked goods will never fly again. Approved foods for songbirds include eggshells. Uh, that's not just because females can use the calcium to make their eggs, but also uh, any birds uh, can use the, uh, the roughage of eggshells um, to help them digest food. I've seen a blue, a blue jay 
a swallow uh, pebbles for that reason. Bananas, apples, and raisins are among the fruits that songbirds can eat. Uh, hard cheese, peas, corn, oats, squash seeds, and peanuts uh, or other nuts are also quite appealing to birds. You can visit uh, any number of websites and find do-it-yourself instructions for uh, a variety of different types of bird feeders. <clears throat> if you decide to um, offer a, a bird feeder like, like this open feeder, uh, you will have the responsibility of checking it regularly to make sure that it's not soiled by the birds themselves. Um, and, and when it is to, to clean it, uh, squirrel baffles are a, a way to keep uh, squirrels away from the seed intended only for birds. Uh, placement of feeders uh, uh, on a, a metal pole is a good idea because predators can't easily climb it. Uh, eight feet long, and if it's buried two feet down, it'll be six feet up. Uh, it should be less than three feet from a window or more than 30 feet away. So that's the, the 330 rule. Um, if it's close enough to the window, then a startled bird flying away from the feeder and uh, con contacting uh, a window will not uh, uh, be injured nearly as much as one that's startled and has, and has gotten, uh, gotten up enough speed uh, to uh, impact that window uh, at, in, in a way that, that's more dangerous to it. Uh, if the um, if vegetation is at, le is at least 12 feet away uh, from the feeder, that uh, makes uh, that ensures that a predator can't lurk in the foliage and then pounce on the birds. Uh, a window feeder is a great idea because uh, in in most cases squirrels and other predators can't reach it, uh, and you won't forget uh, or you you'll notice more readily that it needs um, cleaning uh, if if that is the case and what's not to like about the birds being so close up. And summer bird feeding is, is perfectly okay. Uh, Orioles love oranges. Uh, bluebirds appreciate uh, mealworms, either dead or alive. You can, you can buy them at the grocery store. Um, rose hip, uh, a rose-breasted grosbeak and other birds will appreciate sunflower seeds. Uh, if you do feed birds in the summer, keep the seed dry by filling the feeders halfway uh, otherwise, um, the seed at the bottom of your feeder might become damp and moldy uh, and refill frequently to prevent mold. Uh, and the seed also will often uh, drop down below the feeder and become moldy in this, uh, even more likely in the summertime. Uh, so that could be fatal to birds. So if you move, move the feeders around or, or make sure that it's really cleaned up uh, regularly down below the feeder, that will help um, ensure the bird's safety and clean those feeders regularly, wash every two weeks, rinse and dry before refilling. You can make homemade suet uh, and there are, only, there are really only two ingredients you need. The first one, the suet or shortening and the uh, cornmeal. Uh, but if you like, you can uh, heat up some peanut butter along with that shortening and then add in the uh, dry ingredients and uh, pour it into molds such as old, uh, such as recycled cans or uh, ice cube trays, and then after two hours in the freezer, uh, that suet is ready to go and to be put into the uh, suit that your suet feeder and offered to the birds. Suet does turn rancid above 50 degrees. A bird bath does not need to be expensive. Uh, you can buy one uh, at a relatively small cost or even make one out of available materials. Birds appreciate. Uh, 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 liquid water during the winter to bathe in or drink. Uh, so you can buy one of these heating elements to uh, give them that opportunity. And if you'd like to make bird boxes, uh, you'll want to learn how to make boxes for different types of birds and also how many birds, how many boxes for a diff uh, given species uh, is advisable to offer in, uh, in any given place. So uh, these eight birds um, have different requirements for birdhouses, and you can learn all about them at allbirds.com. Uh, they have uh, different needs in terms of the dimensions of the box floor, the box height, the entrance height, the entrance diameter, and the placement of the bird box uh, from, from the ground, the distance, distance above the ground level. Uh, here's a diagram of a basic bird box. This happens to be for a bluebird. And you'll notice that there are three holes at the top of each side, which allows for ventilation. There are three holes at the bottom for um, uh, drainage. And also the, the hinges on the side allow you to open that box to clean it and to inspect it. 
a pole with, uh, again, the metal pole is good to uh, d deter predators and uh, you'll, you'll want a, a, a placement in the shade is ideal so that it doesn't overheat uh, uh, with a clear flight path and the, and the hole of the bird box should be facing away from the prevailing wind. Uh, starlings and house sparrows are both non-native birds. They are invasive as well. They have uh, significantly impacted uh, our populations of our own native birds, uh, and, and not only by displacing them, but also at times uh, killing the eggs or the chicks of our uh, native bird species. So uh, starlings and house sparrows are not protected by the state. You are free to trap or harass them if, if you choose. Please don't offer uh, colorful birdhouses because they attract predators and also don't offer a perch. It's totally unnecessary for birds. They can come right to, they can either grab onto the side of the birdhouse with their uh, claws or simply go right into the hole and they don't need that perch. But a perch makes, uh, makes the, uh, the birdhouse more accessible to some predators. Uh, also birdhouses should be made only of wood and should not dangle freely from a string. They should be securely fastened. Uh, squirrels can gain entry to birdhouses by uh, uh, chewing the, the hole and making it larger. Uh, so uh, you can prevent that by adding this uh, piece of hardware on the right to the box. And uh, you can also, you should also protect birdhouses from predators in any ways that you see uh, shown on this slide. It's particularly important if you put a birdhouse on the tree trunk that you make sure that uh, predators are not, not able to access the eggs or the chicks. You should clean the, your birdhouse at the end of the summer with a nine to one solution of water and bleach. Uh, scrub it down real good and uh, consider also offering a roost box over the winter to allow birds to find a place uh, away from the elements, protected from the elements and also uh, enable them to huddle next to each other. Uh, bird nesting materials, it can, it can be fun to uh, offer them in a suet feeder or a, uh, a mesh bag and any of these um, materials will do. People often, uh, when they groom their cat or dog, they'll save the hair uh, or the animal fur and then uh, put it on a, a branch or something so the birds will find it. But any of these items are uh, appealing and useful to birds. And it's, uh, it's one of those activities that if, if you do it with children, they might be uh, quite enthusiastic about uh, watching and noticing when birds actually help themselves to these contents. There's uh, uh, the one food that's the most important for uh, chicks is, uh, for, for uh, many chicks is, the, is caterpillars. They're soft, they, they have the ideal um, uh, nu uh, nutrient, nutritional content for chicks. Uh, so it's, a, it's the ideal baby food. And uh, this mother uh, black capped chickadee will need to find 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to fledge her chicks. And so uh, in order to find them, she's gonna have to find native plants to forage on. Uh, the reason for this, uh, and uh, Doug Tallamy is the author of these two books. Uh, he explains that uh, science shows that uh, non-native plants that, that were brought over fairly recently um, have chemical defenses in their leaves that our, our, uh, our, our caterpillars uh, are simply not able to uh, digest. Uh, they figured out how to digest leaves of native plants because they've been here on uh, on our continent for you know thousands and thousands of years. So caterpillars have had uh, time to uh, decode their uh, these chemicals and uh, and digest them. Uh, so uh, and the other uh, point that uh, Doug well one uh, uh, one observation Doug Tallamy makes is that it currently our landscaping favors non-native plants. We have about 70% of the plants that uh, are in our landscapes are non-native and it should be reversed. It should be at least 70% um, and ideally more uh, native plants. And his book, Nature's Best Hope, uh, he explains that we can't depend on publicly owned land to offer enough habitat to turn around the alarming declines of wildlife. So we really need to, to think about uh, privately owned land as offering uh, more uh, of the uh, habitat that they require. Uh, and think, so we, we, he actually calls it the, uh, the uh, home, homegrown national park. Uh, and so think of our, 
uh, you know, the collectively all of our uh, private property, uh, we can think of them as uh, nature sanctuaries. Uh, and so in order to create this homegrown national park, Doug Tallamy is, is saying first, think about shrinking the lawn and uh, perhaps consider lawn to be pathways between uh, other uh, plantings, uh, remove invasive species because they're taking the place uh, and, and will kind of spoil our efforts uh, to plant natives. Um, plant keystone genera, the big five trees are the birches, poplars, the cherries and plums, the oaks and the willows, uh, because those are the ones that attract the most, uh, are the, our hosts for the most uh, caterpillars. Uh, be generous with your planting. So both the numbers of plants, uh, of woody plants and, and non-woody plants, and the variety of them. Uh, plant for specialist pollinators. Network with your neighbors and explain to them what you're doing and, and see if you can make it a, a community effort. Uh, build a conservation hardscape. What he means by that is, for example, window well covers will prevent uh, small animals from falling in and, and perishing uh, or as, you know, starving uh, in, in those areas. Uh, and, in, and instead of having uh, continuously um, illuminated lights, motion sensor lights are vastly better for uh, wildlife. Uh, mowing no lower than three inches allows uh, various flowers to grow and, uh, and to bloom in your lawn. Uh, and also providing bubblers for birds will attract them. Those that, that moving water is irresistible for birds. Uh, create pupation sites under trees. The, the majority of uh, caterpillars fall from the trees uh, and, uh, and in the fall, uh, they just drop down. And then uh, if there are no leaves uh, or other native vegetation to hide under, they are easy picking uh, for any predators. Uh, do not spray or fertilize with uh, any with synthetic fertilizer, uh, fer uh, fertilizers and educate your neighborhood civic association to make sure that they are not um, uh, part of the problem. Sometimes civic associations uh, don't want things to look too natural uh, and uh, they, need to, they need to be natural, of course. So um, allaboutbirds.org is a website all about uh, birds that's provided by uh, a Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. And here is their list of the best trees, vines, and shrubs to plant for birds. Uh, the oaks, as I mentioned, are one of those keystone species. They're a lot of host, uh, it's a host plant for a lot of caterpillars. Uh, mulberries are very, uh, they're delicious. Uh, I, I love to eat them myself, so I understand why birds do. Sassafras fruits are appealing to birds, so are elderberries. Uh, uh, and I also love elderberries. I put them in my pancake batter and, uh, or in my hot cereal or, or, or so. Uh, elderberries are also uh, a great pollinator plant uh, the, when, the, when they're in bloom. Uh, and I think one of our prejudices about uh, native plants is that we assume that they are not gonna be as beautiful as the non-natives. And I beg to differ. Uh, here you see a, a wild raisin or nannyberry uh, just uh, gorgeous in all seasons. Uh, and it has the pollinator value as well as the uh, edible fruits for birds. Uh, all the viburnums are uh, in that category, just uh, our native, we can think of it as uh, ornithomentals, um, ornithology being the study of birds. Um, so airwood, uh, maple leaf viburnum in the shade uh, is a smaller viburnum and a, a taller, uh, almost a tree, uh, black haw viburnum. And all the dogwoods are uh, both attractive and useful for birds. In, in August and September, uh, these gray dogwoods could be stripped of their fruit by migrating uh, birds. Uh, red osier dogwood, what a sensational uh, ornithomental this one is. Uh, white dogwood, very popular with, with people and birds as well. Um, notice at the bottom of the slide, it says, get 10 free trees, arborday.org. So if you visit their website, you will see that you can get uh, one each of all of these trees listed here, or 10 each of the white dogwood or American redbud, river birch, any of these half dozen conifers. All you have to do is give them a donation, any amount that you choose to donate, and they will send you your, your 10 free trees. Spicebush is a shrub that has fruit, 50% uh, 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 fat uh, content. So that's a lot of uh, useful energy for birds. Uh, blueberries, irresistible. 
June berries as well. I consider June berries to be just as tasty, if not more so than uh, blueberries. This is a, a native tree. It's a small tree that blooms in May, and then the fruits uh, come, come follow. They're uh, they uh, they're uh, often stripped from the tree by birds because they're so popular. And it's a beautiful plant in all seasons. Uh, so is uh, so is hawthorn uh, and crabapple. Black cherry and choke cherry, quite popular with birds. So is black choke berry or Aronia melanocarpa. Uh, this is a native shrub that is often planted as, as an ornamental uh, and it's edible for both humans and birds. You have to realize that uh, this fruit needs to be cooked, otherwise it won't taste that great. But once you do cook it, you appreciate uh, just how delicious and nutritious this fruit is also medicinal. Uh, but if you want to learn about uh, uh, just the practical aspects of uh, planting various shrubs or trees or, or any plant uh, on your property, uh, simply visit missouribotanicalgarden.org and you can uh, discover this kind of useful information. Uh, and, and if you type Missouri in the, either the name, common name or Latin name of the plant, you'll come to the page that shows uh, what, what zone it lives in. Um, and since we're in zone five, this is well within our zone. Uh, the height uh, to expect that it will go, uh, grow at maturity, the spread at maturity, when it blooms, the, the color of the bloom, um, uh, what uh, sun requirement it has uh, in water, uh, in this case, it's low maintenance and the uses. Uh, on, on you go down the list, attractive to birds, uh, tolerates wet soil. And then the garden locations, uh, if you click on that, you'll find uh, places to purchase uh, these, uh, the, the plant that you're learning about. Uh, blackberries and black raspberries are appealing to birds. So are, are the fruits of staghorn sumac, which are available into the early winter. And winterberry holly, which is available throughout the winter, uh, is a dioecious plant. You'll need to plant the males uh, so that those flowers on the male plants can pollinate the female flowers and uh, enabling them to uh, make these stunningly beautiful red fruits. Uh, Northern bayberry is a, a fruit that's available in the dead of winter to birds. It's a welcome uh, sight to a hungry bird. Uh, and conifers provide, often provide seeds for birds and other wildlife, in addition to providing uh, a, a sanctuary, a shelter from the elements, a place to uh, establish their nests, and also, uh, surprisingly, host to a variety of um, uh, caterpillars. There are 20 different, 200 different species of moth and butterfly caterpillar that will visit white pine needles. Uh, Eastern red cedar has edible fruit for birds. And so once you've dis decided which uh, um, plants you want to establish on your property, think about where uh, the best places would be. Uh, ours, uh, these are called micro habitats because different places of your property will have different, uh, may have different um, uh, conditions. The hours of sunlight may be different, the moisture and drainage, the soil texture. Uh, compaction is something that, uh, you know, there, there, there are, uh, there are plants that are tolerant of shade or tolerant of uh, either dry or moist soils or tolerant of extremes of soil texture, but no plant can grow in a severely compacted soil. So be alert to uh, first avoiding compaction, uh, uh, avoid the temptation, for example, to get into a garden and, and to tromp around uh, when the garden is damp because that will compact the, the soil. Uh, in general, stay away, stay off your gardens if possible. Um, and uh, the four um, criteria at the bottom of this slide, soil micronutrients, soil fertility, pH, and salinity, all can be determined by a, a soil test. You can send a soil sample to the UMass um, Soil Testing Laboratory in, uh, in Amherst. Once you've decided where you're gonna put that tree or shrub, you wanna dig a hole no deeper than necessary, but much wider than you might think uh, is, is uh, required. The reason for that is that the roots uh, will be growing laterally, not uh, down, but out. Uh, that's because the water and minerals are more available uh, near the surface. Uh, so by digging an extra wide hole, you, you make it easier for those roots to grow laterally. Uh, and avoid the temptation to uh, give uh, 
well, say a generous helping of manure or, or a compost or something in that hole because that will uh, spoil the roots. It will, um, they won't uh, tend to grow out quickly enough because they'll uh, be satisfied to stay where they are. There's plenty of nutrients. Uh, so they won't be growing out as fast as they otherwise would. And if you keep the topsoil and subsoil in separate piles, then when, you re, uh, when the plant is in the hole, you would put the subsoil back in first and then the topsoil to follow. Um, and by surrounding uh, that sapling with mulch, uh, uh, even to the drip line, that helps to preserve moisture and uh, minimize competition. And if you, you can also create a rim, uh, to, uh, kind of a bowl effect, so that when it rains or when you irrigate the plant, uh, the water will stay there and uh, be funneled to the uh, to that plant. Um, be aware that in the, at least in the first couple of years of establishment of a young sapling, you will need to water it uh, during uh, prolonged dry periods. And consider uh, protecting your sapling if you uh, live in a place where you know that there might be hungry vegetarians like deer or uh, rabbits or uh, small rodents during the winter. So Virginia creeper fruits are edible for birds, but not for us. Uh, grapes are very popular with birds, wild honeysuckle fruits, uh, and bearberry is a ground cover that's a, a native, it's a evergreen, and it uh, requires full sun, another one that birds like. Uh, and what bird, what bird would turn down the opportunity to eat sunflower seeds when available? There are many other plants that offer edible seeds that are related to sunflower, which is in the Asteraceae family or the Aster family. Uh, Black-eyed Susan is one. You can see the family resemblance. Uh, purple coneflower also has edible seeds for birds. And so do, do all these plants, a uh, sedum in the, uh, at the bottom uh, uh, and middle of this slide is the only non-Aster uh, uh, non family plant uh, uh, on the slide. So uh, all the rest are uh, Asteraceae plants. Uh, so when you, if you leave your seed stalks standing through the winter, it adds uh, some aesthetic interest for the for us, and and you, you might uh, appreciate the fact that uh, plants such as purple coneflower, black-eyed Susan, coreopsis, sunflower, and gay feather, and the grasses such as switchgrass and little blue stem, uh, all might be offering those seeds to birds uh, to help them get through the winter. And also, if you leave the leaves that will give birds a chance to find uh, various uh, morsels to eat and it will give protection to the rest of the uh, caterpillars and other small animals that are uh, remaining in the leaves and enable them to continue their life cycles. Uh, leave dead trees and snags if they are not a hazard uh, to people or to your uh, dwelling uh, that, provide, uh, that can provide um, nesting sites and uh, habitat for insects. And brush piles offer the three S's, sanctuary, shelter, and snacks. Uh, sanctuary when a bird is being pursued by a predator, uh, shelter from the elements, and uh, uh, th finding th things to eat. Uh, so remember that birds need food, water, shelter, and places to rear their young. And by planting uh, uh, these, these uh, uh, um, valuable uh, native uh, perennial plantings, we can provide three of these four, the food, shelter, and places to rear their young. Um, gardening for wildlife connects us to nature, uh, but there is there's not much nature in this, uh, at least not, not much that's useful to uh, our, our native um, wildlife uh, in this picture, except for possibly the, the, the tree, which might be a native tree. Uh, but our, uh, our standards for uh, a neat and orderly um, uh, landscape perhaps originate from uh, uh, aristocracy four centuries ago in England. Uh, they were uh, kind of showing off that they didn't need to use their land to grow food and they could afford to hire uh, workers who were out there with their scythes uh, cutting, uh, cutting the grass down to make it look uh, almost like an extension of the indoors. But we pay an a, a unconscionable price for, for this kind of standard of landscaping it because it's a food desert for wildlife and also a polluter and a resource guzzler. Uh, far more synthetic pesticides are used on a lawns per acre than uh, in agricultural land. Uh, we use an incredible amount of water to keep this, um, 
these, these, uh, this grass alive through the summer. Uh, and so our, our lawns are really on life support because we're using primarily this non-native bluegrass. It's not actually from Kentucky, it's from Eurasia. Uh, it's fine for Britain where there's damp uh, su summers and uh, Kentucky bluegrass is fine, but we end up having to water it and, and feed it and everything else. So um, uh, uh, you might consider for the areas that you do want to preserve as lawn, uh, a, a grass called turf type tall fescue. Uh, the roots can get as deep as four feet, uh, which means that you may not need to water them at all. And it needs less fertilizer, less mowing. Uh, it, it can be grown in shade or sun and it looks almost identical to Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, if you have problems establishing a lawn, if, it's, if there's too much shade or standing water or erosion, why not plant native perennials, shrubs, and trees that know exactly how to handle situations like this? And I invite you to visit Mary Ann Borges' website, thenaturalweb.org. Her uh, articles are very informative, easy to read, and her, fo her photography is absolutely stunning. Environmental organizations are asking us to reduce our lawns by at least 25%, which I think is a reasonable goal. And it's good for, not only good for the wildlife, but we'll find uh, that it's, it really adds to our quality of life uh, to appreciate, uh, to just feel good about doing something that's helpful and, and uh, the enjoyment of watching uh, your property come alive. But natural landscaping uh, needs to make more converts. Uh, there are some concerns that people have about it. Uh, does natural landscape uh, landscaping attract vermin? No, uh, rats are not sustained in, in uh, landscapes like this. Well, how about Lyme disease ticks? Uh, that is a legitimate concern. Uh, and by providing setbacks or paths for walking, uh, the tick will s simply not be able to attach itself to you unless you, uh, if, if you're not brushing against those plants that where they are lying and waiting. Uh, LymeDisease.org is a, a good resource to uh, check out other ways to prevent ticks in your yard. Uh, you can also purchase uh, tick repellent with any of these four ingredients and consider uh, if you really are seriously uh, concerned about ticks and if you're outdoors a lot, you might want to spray your clothing and gear with permethrin at least 48 hours before use. It not only repels, it actually kills ticks, mosquitoes, chiggers, mites, and other insects on contact. Uh, it's not toxic to us. Um, it lasts through six washings or even 70 washings if it's a pre-treated, uh, uh, factory treated clothing. Uh, consider also that if you have natural landscaping, uh, a variety of, uh, of our native animals uh, are uh, eager to help themselves to those ticks and help to preserve uh, or help to uh, uh, control their uh, tick populations. That includes amphibians, the, the guinea hen, the opossum. Uh, mosquitoes are another concern that people often have about natural landscapes, but consider that lawns are more likely to have standing puddles than, uh, than um, native plantings. Uh, and if you do decide to have a pond, which is a great way to attract wildlife, consider that mosquito larvae uh, are, uh, are able to live in um, stagnant water. And if you install a solar activated pump and keep that water in motion, that will take care of the mosquito problem. You can also stock ponds with koi, goldfish, or mosquito fish to control their populations. And there is a bacterium called BTI or Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis that's a natural uh, um, control uh, it's called uh, mosquito dunks or mosquito bits uh, in the trade, and they're, they're quite effective at eliminating mosquito larvae. Allergenic pollen affects many people, uh, but uh, it's not native plants that are the problem. It's the non-native plants and grasses, such as ragweed, uh, public enemy number one for allergy sufferers, and uh, other plants such as lamb's quarters, red root, red root, amaranth, English plant, and all of these are wind pollinated plants. Goldenrod is not uh, a problem for, uh, uh, it, uh, the pollen is not allergenic. It's not generally windborne. It's, it's uh, um, attractive to pollinators. And so it, uh, carried, the pollen is carried by bees and butterflies, not by the wind. Uh, there are some grasses and also some trees that have uh, allergenic pollen, but uh, in general, native, uh, pop, native uh, plantings are not a problem as, as far as allergies. 
And then there's the question of how will it affect my property value? Um, and uh, I've, I believe that a well-managed and well-planned landscape uh, is stunningly beautiful and will significantly enhance your property values. So studies have been done about this, which demonstrate uh, you know, planting trees, planting shrubs, uh, you know, a tastefully uh, arranged landscaping. It's, it's great for your property uh, value. And one way to, to make it look quite uh, um, appealing is massing of, of one or maybe two species. Um, and if you cover the foundation, that's one landscaping principle. Uh, uh, otherwise, land, uh, foundations look kind of bare. Notice in this photo that there's a large pot uh, and paths and a bird bath. So when there are things that look intentional in a landscape, it, it's appealing. Uh, here's an example of that as well. Crisp edges and bold patterns uh, are attractive to our uh, aesthetic sensibilities. Uh, we uh, the first thing we're doing when we're uh, we should do when we uh, create a plan for our landscapes is to make sure that we recognize invasive plants, inventory them, uh, and then make a realistic plan for how to either eliminate or control them and follow through with that plan. Japanese knotweed is one of the worst culprits. Uh, it has deep roots that uh, are difficult uh, to, well, it's not that difficult to remove most of the roots, but then they're uh, always gonna be some pieces of the roots remaining in the soil that will continue to send up shoots. So uh, uh, you might try uh, digging uh, and, and, and then repeated cutting uh, of the shoots every three weeks or so, but it might take, uh, you know, for the entire season, growing season to do that uh, every three weeks, and it'll take three or four years before those roots finally give up. Another approach is to cover it with a, a sturdy plastic or other barrier that's, that simply does not allow those shoots to come up. And, and if they do come up, you can uh, stomp them down with your feet and uh, kill them that way. Um, Oriental bittersweet is a very destructive vine that can actually kill trees by girdling them. Uh, and so if trees, if, if this vine has successfully made it up to the canopy of, of any trees on your property, you should uh, cut the vines back at least so that they can't uh, flower and set seed uh, up, up there in the, in the canopy of the tree, and then dig up as many as you can uh, on your property. Autumn olive is a shrub that is way too successful uh, and it's displacing our native um, plantings, our native species, so does multiflora rose. Burning bush should never have been introduced to our country because it's so, um, and, and it's no longer allowed to be sold in nurseries. Uh, gout weed, garlic, mustard, black swallowwort, or other uh, are in herbaceous invasive plants to watch out for. Uh, so uh, look at uh, uh, masslive.com uh, for other, uh, I think there's some 31 plants that are discussed at that uh, website, invasive plants in Massachusetts. Uh, migrating birds prefer native fruits because they're more nutritious. Blueberries, black cherries, and black raspberries, uh, they'll, um, but they'll turn up their beaks at Japanese barberry, oriental bittersweet, and multiflora rose, rose even when they are far more abundant than these other um, uh, native fruits in a given area, simply because birds recognize that they, they are less nutritious. Uh, poison ivy is actually a native and um, a native plant that has uh, uh, white fruits that are uh, available in the winter for birds to eat, but um, if you have it on your property and you're concerned about becoming coming in contact with it, you will want to eradicate it. And if, if you want to transition from any vegetation, whether it's poison ivy or lawn or weeds uh, and, and go to native plantings, uh, they're the easiest and uh, uh, le least expensive and the uh, uh, least work involved is simply to smother it with uh, compostable um, cardboard or newspaper. Uh, the newspapers should be six thicknesses, uh, six sheets, and, it, and they should be um, uh, overlapping to make it more difficult for those uh, perennial plantings to um, make their way through. Uh, and then after you've laid out, and the, the uh, photo in the lower right is called ram board. It's simply cardboard uh, on a roll uh, for larger areas that need to be smothered. And then you would cover those, uh, the cardboard with mulch to, uh, to both to make it look good and to, uh, and, and to 
Uh, the benefits of mulch include suppressing weeds, keeping the soil moist and cool, and enriching the soil. Uh, if you're starting an annual bed for you know, your traditional vegetable garden or for, um, or for uh, annuals, annual flowers, uh, grass clippings, straw, shredded leaves, and pine needles are all great for that purpose. Uh, pine needles do not make the soil acidic as, um, as some even experts believe because that myth has been passed, passed on for so long. Uh, for perennial beds, shredded leaves and pine needles are good, uh, uh, although shredded leaves will decompose fairly quickly. Uh, pine bark, uh, sawdust is okay, wood chips are great, chip branch wood is, is great also. Uh, branches that are sent a uh, uh, process through a chipper. Uh, avoid dyed mulch. It's often contaminated with creosote and CCA. Uh, and don't overuse mulch. Vol vol volcano mulch around a tree is bad uh, for the tree because roots will be encouraged to grow up there uh, into the um, compost and uh, uh, into the uh, mulch rather. And then as the mulch decomposes, those roots will be exposed. Uh, and think about mulch as a temporary expediency. Uh, ultimately, you want a lot of vegetation and you don't want to have to keep on reapplying mulch. Uh, and this is an example, this is a rain garden which is receiving water from uh, the roof uh, and, and the downspout is directing it to the garden. Um, and notice that there just aren't any opportunities for weeds to grow here because the, the plants that are intentionally planted are claiming that space. Uh, Think also about how ground covers can serve as a living mulch. They prevent weeds and retain moisture and keep the soil cool just like mulches do. And in addition, they can hold the soil in place on slopes. Some of my favorite ground covers are bearberry, which I've mentioned earlier, uh, thyme, which is great for beekeepers because it has thyme oil that combats uh, uh, varroa mites, um, three-leaved sinkfoil, a beautiful um, evergreen uh, planting of a, for a ground cover. Golden star with its stunning yellow flowers. Wild ginger can handle dense shade. Uh, Bishop's hat is also shade tolerant and it just beautiful flowers and leaves. Allegheny Pachysandra is a native alternative to the invasive Japanese Pachysandra. And I, I think that it's much more um, uh, aesthetically appealing. It has a mottled coloration and it has a softer look than the Japanese Pachysandra. Uh, barren strawberry is a good choice for a ground cover, very effective. Um, and it's uh, evergreen as well. And then there's wild strawberry, uh, which is a fantastic plant for wildlife because it's a native that uh, is a host plant for many uh, butterfly and moth species. Now let's talk about hummingbirds. They are beneficials because they're both predators and pollinators. They uh, eat a lot of insects, they're expert hunters. And uh, the only hummingbird that you're going to see here in New England, or, or that you're likely to see, is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, we don't need to be concerned about their population because it's doubled in the last uh, half, day, half century. Uh, but people love hummingbirds so much that uh, it, uh, we, we, we enjoy attracting them to our property, provide moving water, they love it, uh, a place to rest, uh, snags for perches. Uh, and when you leave dead trees, uh, you give the woodpeckers and sapsuckers a chance to uh, uh, explore the, the trees for whole for uh, insects. And then, uh, when the trees bleed, the the sap uh, that uh, it, that's in those holes attracts insects, which the hummingbirds can help themselves to. Uh, hummingbirds also need spider silk to make their webs. They uh, uh, and the, uh, the nest, which always has two eggs in it, uh, those eggs will hatch. And, the, and as the chicks grow, because spider silk is, is a construction material of that nest, it will double in size. The nest will double in size as the chicks grow, which is uh, quite unique for a bird nest. It's okay to rescue a hummingbird chick or any other chick. It's not true that uh, the touch of a human will, uh, be, uh, will cause the, the adult um, bird to reject the chick. Um, hummingbird feeders, uh, this is, here's an ideal uh, construction if you want to feed hummingbirds uh, with sugar water. It's a, you can detach the two halves easily and clean them easily. Um, one cup, it's, it's a four to one ratio, a cup of water to one quarter cup of sugar, no substitutes. Uh, you shouldn't use brown sugar or molasses or, anything, or honey or anything else and no food coloring. 
Heat to dissolve and refrigerate, use within one week. Uh, replace every few days and clean every three days. Um, with hot tap water, scrub the sides. Don't use soap because soap residue is bad for the hummingbirds. Uh, if, there, if black mold occurs in that feeder, you should soak in a solution of one quarter cup, be cup bleach to one gallon of water. That's a 164, 1 to 64 ratio for an hour. Um, and be vigilant if the nectar becomes cloudy and is spoiled and needs to be replaced. Uh, nectar may start to ferment in just one day. Trumpet creeper is a vine that um, has a variety of sugars that uh, are just right uh, and also uh, um, some amount of minerals, proteins, amino acids, and you don't have to worry about that nectar spoiling. So uh, I, I would prefer simply to offer flowers to hummingbirds. And uh, while you would not put a trumpet creeper vine near your, uh, uh, near your dwelling because it can be destructive to your dwelling, uh, but out on, on your property uh, where it's uh, safe to have it, it's uh, irresistible to hummingbirds. Here's another vine that they love, trumpet honeysuckle and cardinal flower, the stunningly red and beautiful uh, uh, plant that's a, a perennial and that likes uh, damp soil, but it'll grow fine in normal soil as well. And a spring blooming native plant called wild columbine, uh, which is available for hummingbirds that have just arrived on their migration. Uh, butterfly weed is another one that offers them wonderful uh, nectar reward. So does anise hyssop. This is a fantastic pollinator plant and mint family. Uh, obedient plant, another mint family flower that attracts hummingbirds. So does blazing star, uh, swamp milkweed, foxglove beard tongue, and a spring blooming plant, purple cone flower, and any phlox species. And now bats are also beneficials because they are predators that they eat nothing but insects. Uh, they're uh, nocturnal hunters. Uh, the two most common species of bat in New England are little brown bat and big brown bat. The little brown bat has uh, had a serious decline, a 90% decline in population due to white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease. So uh, if we offer them clean roosts uh, in a bat house that's either uh, constructed or purchased, uh, that it, that will be free of the white nose syndrome, uh, you're not likely to uh, be successful in uh, attracting bats to a bat house unless you live fairly near a large body of water. Uh, and you're not allowed to evict bats uh, in the middle of the summer because they are raising their pups then. Uh, Mass.gov has a web, uh, uh, a link, uh, Homeowner's Guide to Bats, that you can learn more. Uh, leave dead trees standing for bats, for bat habitat. Don't use pesticides. Keep your cats indoors because cats, can, if they find uh, a bat roost, they can decimate that population of bats. Uh, minimize artificial lighting that's uh, disrupting and disturbing to bats. And now on to those ever popular butterflies and moths, which are beneficials because they are pollinators. Uh, butterflies in general are more uh, attractive, more brightly colored than moths. Uh, they are active at, in the daytime while moths are uh, nocturnal. Uh, and moths are far more numerous than butterflies. They're 20 times more moths and 20 times the diversity uh, of species than butterflies. Uh, moths have uh, antennae that look like feathers compared to the butterflies, which are simple and club-tipped. Uh, butterflies make chrysalises and moths spin cocoons. Butterflies and moths are in trouble. 33% population reduction of butterflies that was measured in, in Ohio in, some, in just two decades. Habitat loss, pesticides, and climate change are the likely culprits. And uh, uh, in uh, a couple of years ago, it, there was a study done in Germany that really alarmed uh, people th the world over uh, because it showed that insect populations had declined by 75% in a quarter of a century in, in Germany. And these were in protected nature preserves. Other similar studies have found uh, all over the world have, have shown large, in some cases, even larger declines than this one. So um, David Wagner, uh, scientist at, at University of Connecticut, uh, explains to us that if a world without insects is not a world that we want to or really can live in, it would be a flowerless world with silent forests, a world of dung and old leaves and rotting carcasses because uh, insects do uh, participate in decomposition of these things, uh, of, of dead bodies. 
uh, a world of collapse or decay and erosion and loss that would spread through ecosystems, spiraling from predators to plants. This is because uh, insects as a whole are keystone species. The, the larger animals simply cannot live without them. We can uh, uh, establish uh, habitat for butterflies with butterfly gardens. Uh, and, and if we do so, we'll be attracting other pollinators as well. Uh, think about for your garden, thinking, uh, thinking about sun is, is uh, important. At least six hours of sun is good. Uh, being near a water source is handy. A shelter from the wind is helpful as well. Uh, host plants are absolutely essential. So those caterpillars can become adult butterflies. Nectar producing plants throughout the growing season is important as well. And please use organic landscaping practices. Uh, don't bother with butterfly boxes. No one has, has ever found a butterfly in a butterfly box. Uh, spiders, sure. Wasps, yes, but, but never a butterfly. Uh, but if you uh, provide mud, they might come. Uh, male butterflies, uh, it's called puddling when they uh, sip the mud and they're, uh, they're after the minerals in the mud, which uh, help them to produce pheromones, a chemical that, uh, that they release into the air and, and it, it attracts females to them. Uh, also, when they mate, they're able to donate those minerals to the, to the eggs, uh, their progeny, um, uh, to make the eggs more um, uh, fertile. Uh, give, so we can give butterflies mud by uh, using an, a repurposed bird bath uh, or a saucer that's nestled in the ground that's filled with gravel or sand. And if you add salt or compost, you'll make sure that those minerals are there and keep it moist for the butterflies. You might want to try offering fruit to butterflies, which, uh, and it can, be, it can be fruit that's turning and not, no longer considered edible for humans, but butterflies will eagerly help themselves. And those, that, those ever important host plants, uh, here are the, uh, most valuable, the four most, most valuable plants according to Na National Wildlife Federation are goldenrod, uh, which su sustains 125 different species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. Strawberry is host to 81 species, sunflower to 58 species, and bird's foot trefo trefoil 32. And there are many others that are in that category of plants that, that will attract and, and will sustain um, these the butterfly and moth caterpillars. Uh, and I, I need to take a, uh, a brief break to make sure I'm plugged in here so I don't lose my power. Okay, I've taken care of that item of business. Uh, so, um, and then there are the trees, which are in incredibly valuable. Oak, 473 species. Um, the genus Prunus, beech plum, cherry, and choke cherry host for 411 species of butterflies and moths. Willows, 399 species. Birch, 393. The list goes on. Uh, here's a spice bush swallowtail uh, and these cute little caterpillars that, uh, that that have fake eyes painted on the sides of their heads to, to uh, intimidate predators. Uh, they probably have real eyes but that, to see through, but they're in, invisible to us. Um, uh, only two plants that, that the, uh, the, these caterpillars can feed on, the spice bush and the sassafras. So the female has to lay her eggs on one, of the other, one or the other. Uh, black swallowtail females will look for something in the uh, fennel family, dill, parsley, Queen Anne's lace carrots to lay their eggs. The uh, host plants for Baltimore checkerspot, turtle head and plantain, which are common weeds uh, in our landscapes. Uh, spring azure, uh, Caterpillars can eat New Jersey tea, viburnum leaves, wet meadow sweet, or dogwoods. Uh, and the host plant for great spangled fritillary and other fritillaries is none other than common uh, blue violet. Uh, the monarch is the best known and best loved uh, butterfly of them all here in New England. And uh, monarchs need uh, some species of milkweed. The common milkweed is the one that is you're most likely to find in fields. Uh, and, uh, but I don't recommend it for your gardens because it, it's a, something of a thug in your garden. It's, it's just uh, way too aggressive. It sends out uh, runners, uh, subterranean runners and, uh, and it'll just uh, take over. So instead of uh, planting common milkweed, I suggest that you either go with swamp milkweed or butterfly weed 
in a sunny position and poke milkweed, which can handle the shade. Uh, as the name implies, swamp milkweed is, is tolerant of, of damp soils, but it can also do fine in, normal, in a normal garden. Butterfly weed, on the, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, can handle dry soils and is also fine in, normal, uh, in a normal garden. Uh, so Monarch Watch is an organization that, that uh, offers a lot of information about the status of monarchs. And you can see that the population has declined dramatically uh, over the years. Uh, and a lot of that is due to glyphosate, which is sprayed on crops, on GMO crops, uh, which uh, eliminates weeds and milkweeds are among them. So if you uh, you can order a sign from Monarch Watch uh, proclaiming proudly that you are uh, helping them with uh, a Monarch way station. Uh, and uh, here is an example of a, a Monarch way station edible, uh, offered by edibleterrace.com. Uh, there are 12 different species here. Two of them are grasses. Uh, and notice how uh, the, uh, the plants are, are in clumps. Uh, and in that, in that way, um, of several individuals of that given species. In that way, the butterflies can uh, easily move from one flower to the next. It, it's not difficult to find uh, another one of that same species. According to Sharon Stichter, who offered this list to North American Butterfly Association, naba.org, you can find it there. Uh, these are her top 15 butterfly plants. And she included butterfly bush, but she might have changed her mind since she um, created this list 10 years ago, because not only uh, do butter, our butterfly bush is not a host plant for any uh, butterfly or moth species. It's, I mean, it's, uh, and there's no question that uh, the flowers are attractive to butterflies. However, um, and, uh, more seriously, uh, it's considered invasive and may become more so in, in the years to come. So instead, it's advisable to plant natives, uh, such as this New Jersey tea, which is a shrub, uh, another shrub, sweet pepper bush. Uh, this tall perennial called compass plant, also called cup plant. Notice the leaves clasping the stem in such a way that when it rains, there'll be a little puddle of water there that uh, birds and insects, pollinators and butterflies uh, can, can help themselves to. A stunningly beautiful plant, pollinator plant, blazing star. Thistle, which is a fairly weedy plant, but butterflies do love it. Uh, asters, any of the asters are appealing to butterflies. So is purple coneflower, uh, scabiosa, joe pieweed, a tall perennial that uh, can grow in moist places, but also uh, does fine in normal soils. The same can be true, uh, can, be, can be said of bone set. Uh, and milkweeds uh, are fantastic for uh, butterflies, not just the monarchs, uh, because it's a host plant for them, but other butterflies uh, eagerly uh, visit these flowers for the nectar. And then there are three annuals that uh, are listed in the, these top 15, the zinnia, Mex Mexican sunflower, and marigolds. Uh, you might want to think about when you're planning your uh, pollinator garden for, for butterflies or other pollinators, um, whether they, these vegetarians might help themselves to those plants uh, in order to find out uh, which plants are safe from deer and other Critters, uh, check out Cornell Cooperative Extension or New England Wildflower Society. Um, and then there are more hungry vegetarians such as rabbits and woodchucks, which can also do damage to your uh, uh, perennial plantings. Uh, again, Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, gives, provides a list of groundhog resistant plants and uh, rabbit resistant garden and landscape plants can be found at um, Pennsylvania State University a website. Uh, consider container gardening if you don't have uh, much in the way of uh, available uh, landscape to plant on. Uh, and the, the bigger the pot, the better because you won't have to water it quite as often. Uh, and also consider planting uh, on the strip of land between the sidewalk and the road. Uh, great opportunity for habitat for butterflies and other pollinators and to lift people's spirits as they pass. Susanna Lerman is a scientist uh, who, uh, who has demonstrated uh, in her research that if you mow your lawn every other week instead of every week, you're providing opportunities for those lawns that, that pop up, uh, those flowers that pop up in lawns to bloom and then opportunities for 
the pollinators to visit them. Uh, she found 111 different species of native bees in the lawns that were allowed to grow for a couple of weeks rather than uh, mowed more regularly. Uh, and she also asks, asks us to mow no closer than three inches. Uh, you can call it whatever you like, bee and butterfly lawn, lazy lawnmower lawn, freedom lawn. And it's, uh, it's fun to watch what happens uh, in these lawns that uh, if, if you don't have the expectation that it looked like a, a, a monoculture of a, a green, a closely cropped green carpet like a, a golf course or something, uh, think of your, your lawn as, as being alive. Uh, but uh, even better, uh, why not uh, consider a wildflower meadow? If you have uh, a section that's of, of uh, property, of your property that's in, that has good uh, sun, full sun, uh, and if it's at least 400 square feet, which isn't that large if you think about it, uh, 20 by 20, um, that's, that's good enough for a wildflower meadow. Uh, you have to, it's, there's a, a process involved in establishing the seed, uh, which includes grass seed as well as the flowers. Uh, you'd, you'd have to take a full year to eliminate existing vegetation. Th that can be done by smothering, but if, the, uh, if there's simply too large of an area uh, to do that conveniently. There are other techniques as well. So I invite you to visit the University of New Hampshire web extension.unh.edu uh, wildflower meadows and learn more about how to establish a wildflower meadow. You might want to have the, the uh, services of a uh, uh, professional landscaper to help you out with that project. But in the end, uh, you're not only going to be helping wildlife and it, it'll be a delight uh, to, to watch uh, those wildflowers grow, but uh, uh, you'll be spending a lot less money than you otherwise would if you had to mow that, that lawn regularly every year. Now, bees are the best pollinators because they have fuzzy bodies and the non-native honeybee, which was not here in, in, on, the, on our continent until the British uh, co uh, colonists brought them, uh, is our most common bee at this time. Uh, think of honeybees as being uh, herd animals because there are almost no feral honeybee hives out there anymore. So they're, they're all being raised by humans. But uh, back before honeybees were introduced, we had uh, here in Massachusetts alone about 400 uh, some species of native bees. You can see there's a range of sizes, but in general, uh, or perhaps almost exclusively, they're not, they're, they're harmless. They're, they're not, uh, most of them are not colony, um, uh, uh, they're, they're not colonial bees, you know, they don't live in colonies, they're solitary bees. And uh, in, in most cases, they, they won't sting you. Um, honeybees uh, do pollinate crops and are important to uh, farmers and gardeners for that reason, as well as making honey. Um, bees and wasps are different. If you say you, you've been bitten by a bee, I might uh, question whether it, there's a possibility that you were bitten by a wasp, such as a yellow jacket instead. Uh, bees generally won't sting you unless, uh, unless you really give them reason to. Uh, but it's reason enough for a yellow jacket if you're walking on their hive, which is uh, because they're ground dwelling. Uh, bumblebees are the other well-known bee in addition to honeybees. Bumblebees are native um, and uh, they have corbiculae on their hind legs, uh, just like uh, honeybees do. They, uh, they can gather a, a large quantity of honey that, uh, of um, of pollen that way, and by adding nectar, it they they keep it uh, uh, all uh, keep that basket uh, intact, that uh, clump of pollen. Uh, and uh, the uh, the female bumblebee has to be uh, has to start her colony all by herself from scratch every uh, spring, so she has to find enough uh, pollen and nectar to feed herself and also her offspring until. Uh, they get to be the size where they can participate in maintaining the colony. Uh, there can be hundreds of bumblebees in a, a bumblebee colony, but that compares to thousands of honeybees uh, in a colony. Uh, buzz pollination is something that bumblebees know how to do. This is a tomato flower that you're looking at, and the pollen is not on the outside of, of the anther, as is the, as the case with most flowers. It's actually inside those uh, those joined anthers and, and uh, the way the, bu the bumblebee accesses it is by vibrating its thoracic muscles at just the right frequency to jar loose the pollen in inside the anthers uh, and they land on the, the bumblebee's body 
and, and that's a, a pollen is a, is a significant uh, protein reward for bees. Other bumblebee pollinated crops include raspberries, cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, and cucumbers. Uh, here's a native flower called turtlehead, which only a bumblebee is strong enough to uh, climb into and uh, help itself to that ample nectar reward inside. Uh, think of flowers as, as being brands, uh, you know, different, different flowers are different brands, trying to um, get brand loyalty uh, from different pollinator species. So uh, if a bumblebee discovers that there's a, a great supply of good tasting nectar in one of these flowers, it will actively seek out another plant just like it, which is uh, in the interest of that plant uh, to, to achieve pollination. Here's another uh, native flower that never really opens and only a bumblebee is able to force its way inside a bottled gentian to pollinate it. Uh, rusty patch bumblebees are extinct in Massachusetts and endangered elsewhere. Uh, uh, the American bumblebee is also threatened. So there are uh, the only two common uh, bumblebees really are the common Easter bumblebee and the two spotted bumblebee here in Massachusetts. The others um, have declined dramatically uh, over the years. And that's due to climate change, loss of habitat, but also pests, pathogens, pesticides, poor nutrition, pollution, because uh, if, if uh, pollinators are depending on the ability to smell the, uh, the uh, fragrance of the flower, uh, pollution will interfere with that ability to detect, uh, detect them by smell. And uh, plants that are non-natives and invasives uh, also affect the ability for bumblebees to forage adequately. Uh, they, they seek abandoned mouse and bird nests and other cavities that are uh, dark and um, uh, protected from the elements. Um, so leave abandoned mouse and bird nests for bumblebees and leave it be landscaping in general is a good idea for, uh, for wildlife. You can either build or purchase a bumblebee nesting box uh, you'll have to provide that bedding, such as an old mouse nest um, or dead moss or th things of that nature, um, because bumblebees are not able to provision that material themselves. Uh, bumblebee mimics include the drone fly and the robber fly. They look enough like bumblebees so that they deter predators. Uh, sweat bees are uh, a ground dwelling uh, solitary bee. 70% uh, of our native bees are ground dwelling and sweat bees are generalists. That means that they're able to uh, uh, forage a, a wide range of different time, types of flowers. Uh, and that, that's a, something of an accomplishment because uh, the, the pollen of different flowers is, is very different in one flower to the next and they're able to digest a, a lot of different types of pollen. Um, notice how beautiful these uh, insects are. They're quite small. They're called sweat bees because they're attracted to our perspiration, but they're totally harmless. Um, and here's a remarkable ground dwelling bee that's actually able to create a plastic bag uh, inside the cavity that it's dug um, to protect that uh, cavity from uh, when, when it lays uh, uh, its egg inside and, and provisions it with uh, the food of both uh, pollen and nectar, which is a uh, bee bread. Um, it's, it's effectively protected from uh, water and from pests. Uh, and then the, the egg will hatch and, and mature to an adult and eat its way out of that plastic bag and into the world. So uh, you can provide habitat for ground nesting bees by keeping an area that's devoid of vegetation uh, several yards across loose well-drained soil, uh, flat areas or earthen banks work well. Sunny and south facing also uh, are advantageous. Soil filled planters are a possibility and stay off that area so you don't disturb them. Uh, uh, the mason bee is not a ground dwelling bee. It's actually a, a cavity nester uh, and they're quite valuable. They're much more efficient at pollinating orchard trees than honeybees are. The reason for this is that after they visit a flower, they're more likely to then leave that plant and go to an entirely different tree uh, and then deliver that pollen to the next, uh, to the flower of a different um, individual uh, tree. Uh, the uh, honeybee is more likely to just work a tree uh, from one flower to the next to the next on that same tree, which does no good uh, to, the, uh, to that uh, individual. It needs to receive pollen from a different plant. So uh, mason bees 
uh, are able to um, use cavities and they uh, partition the, their egg chambers with mud. Uh, and a leafcutter bee is able to cut an, an, an incredibly perfect circle from a leaf blade uh, and then roll it up and insert it into a cavity and use it for, the, uh, for an egg chamber. Uh, blueberries, onions, carrots, and alfalfa are all pumble, uh, pollinated by leafcutter bees. And here are some of the leaves that they can use. Um, and I, I was delighted. Uh, uh, I, had some, I have some tick trefoil in my garden. And last year, I found some of those leaves with those perfect circles cut out of them. And I was proud to know that uh, I, had, I was sustaining um, leafcutter bee populations. Uh, if you have roses and you see uh, the, the photo in the lower right there is of, of rose leaves uh, uh, that have been visited by leafcutter bees, uh, you don't need to be alarmed because that rose is still perfectly healthy. Uh, it's bound to be photosynthesizing enough uh, so that it'll, um, it'll continue to uh, do just fine even, even with the disfigurement that you see. Uh, so someone drilled three holes in a block of wood and leafcutter bees used one uh, cavity. Uh, there are some uh, about half dozen separate chambers uh, there that are surrounded by leaves and, uh, in the top row. Uh, rosin bees used rosin to create their chambers and the mason bee used uh, mud. And you'll see uh, about four, four or five uh, cocoons in those chambers. Uh, so you can offer cavity nesting bees uh, a bee hotel uh, by providing uh, plant stalks that are hollow at one end. Japanese knotweed is ideal for this uh, if you use the old, uh, the dead stalks from last year. And they do uh, have uh, one, uh, you know, one end of each section will be uh, sealed and the other will be open. And a variety of uh, uh, diameters from 3 32nd of an inch to 3 8 of an inch wide can be provided for different types of bees. Uh, the, the wider it is, uh, the, the longer your stem should be. Um, and you'll see uh, one, uh, the, the, uh, in the photo at the bottom there, someone is rolling a piece of paper around a dowel. You could also use a pencil. Uh, the reason for that is that those uh, rolled up pieces of paper will be inserted into the stalks. And then at the end of the season, you can harvest the cocoons and uh, remove the diseased cocoons, keep the healthy ones, and put them in the freezer, in the right, not the freezer, but the refrigerator. Um, and then that's a safe place for them over the winter, uh, putting them in a release box in the spring when all danger of really cold weather is past. Uh, and all they need is a box with a small opening for them to fly out of. And uh, that, that's a way that uh, many people are enjoying helping out our native bees. Uh, this, the following list of plants uh, that in the slides to come are the ones that are uh, attractive to the most number, uh, most be native bees, and the one in first place attracting 15 different native bee genera is wild bergamot. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, bee balm, which is a bergamot, uh, 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 closely related to wild bergamot, Medarda didyma. Uh, so bee balm has those stunningly red flowers, uh, but wild bergamot, uh, is, the, is the champion uh, at attracting um, native bees and also butterflies. Uh, Black-eyed Susan is in second place, attracting 14 native bee genera. Boneset, 13 genera. Uh, and there are six plants tied for fourth place. Uh, swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, uh, tick seed, coreopsis, uh, oxeye sunflower, mountain mint, and blue vervain. I'd like to comment about mountain mint. It's one of my favorite pollinator plants. Um, uh, unlike other mints, it's not particularly uh, aggressive as an invasive plant, uh, although it will spread and you'll want it to, uh, but it's easy enough to contain it once it's gotten, once that uh, clump has gotten big enough. Uh, and it attracts all kinds of different pollinators. You'll see that, you see that great black, black wasp on the right, a totally harmless wasp, just a beautiful creature. Uh, tachinid fly in the upper left is a beneficial organism. And then the bumblebee in the lower left uh, it's uh, thousands of, of insect visits uh, throughout the long growing, uh, the long, long flowering season of these mountain mints. And in addition, if you take those leaves and crush them and, and apply them to your skin, it's an effective mosquito repellent that lasts about a half hour or so. 
on with the show, uh, foxglove beer tongue cup plant, as we saw the compass plant earlier, New England aster, golden alexanders, uh, which is a spring blooming plant. So is the foxglove beer tongue. And it's uh, important to have those spring and fall blooming. So the, it, the asters are fall blooming, uh, but wild geranium is spring blooming. Uh, yellow coneflower, uh, anise hyssop, purple coneflower, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, ironweed if it can get to impressive heights. Uh, Culver's root is capable of growing in the shade. Uh, purple coneflower, let's talk about uh, those cultivars because uh, while there are a hundred different uh, varieties of co uh, coneflower that have been bred, the one in the upper left is, is the native type. But green jewel is virtually worthless because pollinators really can't see that color. Uh, Magnus is also worthless because it has no pollen and nectar at all. It's just petals. And Double Delight has very meager uh, offerings of pollen and nectar compared to the purple coneflower. And, and uh, Harebell, Wild Lupin, and Bloodroot are also valuable in terms of attracting a lot of different kinds of native bees. Uh, Non-bee plants or plants that are virtually worthless include the pansy, the daylily, hybrid tea rose. Uh, it's clear that there's no pollen or nectar there, it's just petals. Uh, same is true of double marigold, petunia, New Guinea impatiens, begonia, peony, and forsythia are also low value plants in terms of native bees. Uh, now, the, uh, the, you're, you remember the three Ps are the beneficials, the pollinators, predators, and parasites. So here are the invertebrate predators and parasites that are valuable in controlling pest populations. Uh, spiders, uh, the, their prey is just about everything possible. They are generalists. So are praying mantises. Uh, so even though they are, play their role in, in uh, limiting pest populations, it's really uh, insects such as the lacewing that focuses its efforts on the pest populations that are the most valuable. Uh, it's the larva uh, of the lacewing that is capable of eating those uh, mealybugs, spider mites, thrips, aphids, and caterpillars. And then the adult, is a pollinator. Uh, you can offer lace wings a hotel by rolling up a piece of cardboard, inserting into a, it, it into a, a, a bottle uh, that has the bottom cut off and then suspending it from branch. Uh, ladybugs uh, also have larvae that are voracious predators of pests. You can see there are many different kinds of uh, uh, ladybug beetles out there. And it's the adults, once again, that are pollinators. Uh, offer uh, ladybugs a hotel by putting pine cones in a mesh bag. Fireflies are considered beneficials because they uh, control insect larvae, uh, snails, and slugs, and we can offer them low-hanging trees, forest litter, long grasses, ponds, and streams. Don't use fertilizers or pesticides, and please turn off your outdoor lights because they are bothered by them. Uh, assassin bugs are uh, quite effective uh, uh, predators, as our hoverfly, uh, another name for that is surfer, surfeit fly. Notice once again, it's the larvae that's, uh, that's doing the uh, pest control and the adult that's visiting flowers. Uh, here's a parasite, a, a trichogramma wasp, this tiny insect laying its eggs in the eggs of much larger insects and controlling their populations that way. And bracketed wasps are truly impressive. Look at that long list of pests that they are capable of um, uh, uh, limiting the population of by laying their eggs in uh, the bodies of those insects. So here are some flowers that will attract those adult uh, uh, predators and parasites. The, any, uh, any member of the uh, Queen Anne's lace dill fennel family is called Apiaceae uh, and the Asteraceae, which is, uh, you know, each of the uh, the aster family, each of, the, each of these uh, inflorescences that we think of as a flower are actually many small florets that are grouped in a compact way uh, together. Um, and here's some more uh, aster family members, boneset, yarrow, coreopsis, and aster. Uh, horse mint, fantastic for wasps. It's a beautiful mint. Uh, bugleweed is a long flower that pops up if you allow it to. Uh, wild bergamot again, and anise hyssop, just uh, very valuable pollinator plants in general. Uh, 
So when we think about natural control of garden pests, uh, and, and uh, farmers call this IPM, integrated pest management, and we can call it intelligent pest management, because why would anyone want to use toxic chemicals in the environment, which are going to harm the very uh, organisms that are beneficial, such as the pollinators, predators, and parasites that we've discussed. So uh, other ways besides providing habitat for these uh, beneficials, we can also uh, protect our, the plants uh, that we're growing with uh, barriers such as floating row covers and keep those pests out. Companion plants can often uh, deter them by repelling them. Hand picking can be feasible in some cases. Uh, and organic pesticides are much preferable to the synthetics which do so much damage uh, and are systemic and, and harm, harming the beneficials. Uh, also, I should, should mention that it, the, the healthier your plants are, the more, the more they are resistant to pests and diseases. Uh, so uh, if you're a gardener that's providing plenty of fertility for your, uh, your vegetables and, uh, and other plants, that you, you might have less of a problem with the pests. Uh, we don't normally think about trees and shrubs as being pollinator plants. We're, we're more likely to think about those herbaceous perennials, but consider that trees and shrubs have such an impressive quantity of flowers when they're in bloom that how could they not be really important plants? A willow is perhaps at the top of your list of plants to consider to benefit pollinators because uh, it blooms in the, in the early spring and stays blooming for a number of weeks and gives and is an important source of both pollen and nectar to a vast variety of different kinds of insects. Uh, there are there are both spring blooming and fall blooming witch hazels. There's this beautiful red bud tree. Uh, fruit trees are great for pollinators. Uh, American plum is a native plum, and uh, uh, beech plum as well. I've seen uh, insects swarming over these flowers when they're in bloom. Uh, it grows on the Cape, but you don't need uh, you don't need to live on the Cape to have beech plum. It, it grows in normal soil just fine. Uh, and uh, so here's the black cherry and choke cherry, which uh, are are feeding the the birds when they're in fruit, but when they're in flower, they are beneficial for pollinators. Same with Virginia rose and Carolina rose, the Juneberry, uh, maples and oaks don't have showy flowers, but they do have pollen and nectar that's available for pollinators. Basswood is a fantastic uh, tree for honeybees. Uh, the blueberries, the red osier dogwood, another pollinator plant. Nine bark is a fantastic shrub for pollinator plants, but don't use the cultivars that have dark leaves because uh, um, it's not a host plant for the nine bark leaf beetle that you see pictured here. Um, winterberry holly, another important pollinator plant. Uh, look at the bees sw swarming over the inflorescence of staghorn sumac on the left there. Uh, viburnums, the flowers of the viburnums and the flowers of our native hydrangeas, panicle and smooth hydrangea, uh, are good for pollinators. And this is a shrub, the mountain laurel, a, a, a native shrub that uh, tolerates a dense shade quite well, uh, irresistible to uh, butterflies and other pollinators, a beautiful plant. Think about spring ephemerals because uh, those, those hungry pollinators out there in the spring, they need uh, those floral resources. And you can, you can put uh, plants like snowdrops and crocuses and other spring ephemerals uh, in areas which will be shaded later on in the, in the summer, but before they leaf out, uh, these plants can do just fine. Siberian squill, wild bleeding heart is a native that blooms again in the fall, bloodroot. Uh, and think about annuals for pollinators. We already talked about sunflower, Mexican sunflower and zinnia. Uh, spider flower is another good one. Uh, so are adjuratum, sweet alyssum, borage, pineapple sage, cosmos. And if you allow your culinary herbs to blossom, there's basil, chives, rosemary, oregano, lavender, and catmint are all uh, good for those pollinators. Uh, now, the same website that offers information about wildflower meadows, extension.unh.edu, will also provide this resource for, of pollinator plants for northern New England. Um, Kathy Neal uh, created this uh, flowering calendar for native pollinator plants. So you can see that uh, each plant is described 
uh, in terms of the color of its bloom. And also you can see how long it's in bloom. Um, and in that way, you can make sure that you have at least three flowers blooming at all times, uh, three in the spring, three in the summer, three in the late summer or, uh, or fall, uh, and, and making sure that your, your garden is providing for the needs of pollinators throughout the season. Um, and uh, this is a fantastic list of, of really high value plants. So at a minimum, you'll, at a minimum, you, you'll want those, those nine different species uh, that span the, the entire uh, growing season. Uh, and you'll want uh, three to five individuals of each plant. So it, uh, one way to, to get that quantity of plants cheaply is to buy seeds. Uh, however, some seeds will not germinate if you just toss them in the soil and uh, without having a cold treatment first. Uh, it's a way to ensure that the seed won't uh, germinate prematurely uh, during a warm fall. So they, they need to have a prolonged period of moist cool temperature between 34 and 41 degrees Fahrenheit, and a refrigerator uh, is just, uh, just right for that. However, it's also possible to simply sow seeds in pots in the fall uh, and then leave them outside and they will experience winter and break dormancy that way. Uh, if you're bagging uh, seeds to put in the refrigerator, you, you'll want to have a, a medium uh, in there to keep it moist, such as vermiculite, uh, sand works for larger seeds, and a moist paper towel would be adequate for smaller seeds. I invite you to visit wildseedproject.org. It's a fantastic um, resource. You can buy your seeds there, and it also provides a lot of information on growing, uh, growing your seeds. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, plant them fairly close together. They seem to enjoy company, uh, but at, at a certain uh, point, you will need to give them their own little um, uh, uh, amount of soil to grow in uh, so the roots can establish. Um, and you can also purchase these plugs uh, from some outlets and they are much, uh, much cheaper than buying large plants um, uh, from, from a nursery or other uh, big box store, etc. Uh, and you also are assured that it's only about a, you know a dollar or two a piece, and you're assured that each plant is is a, a unique individual genetically, um, one from the other. Um, I, I've heard of a, a, a volunteer project that was done um, in nearby Northampton uh, on a slope. Uh, this this team of volunteers uh, stripped that slope of sod uh, of, of the grass, uh, and then um, put plugs in. And this was in November. Uh, put plugs in and then just left it. Uh, and next spring, they, those plugs, those plants were ready to go and just took off. And so it was a very successful um, project that created a, a pollinator habitat there on that slope where before it was simply uh, a monoculture of grass. Um, there are There is a time and a place for vegetative propagation. This is swamp milkweed. And I found a, a clump of four uh, stalks and I uh, un unearthed it and used clippers to separate those four so that I could spread them out. And I had enough genetic diversity in my garden so I didn't need to be concerned about whether uh, those plants could still uh, be pollinated by a, a different individual. Uh, so uh, cloning can give you more quantity. Uh, and here is uh, another example of vegetative propaganda, pr pr propagation. If you uh, uh, bury uh, a stem it, that can induce it to form roots and then you can clip it, uh, sever it from the parent plant and, and plant it out. Uh, and a cutting is another way to do this. If you uh, cut a stem and remove the lower leaves, uh, you don't want to be burying leaves in the soil and then put it in a pot and uh, that will induce that stem to root. Uh, but it only works for some species. Uh, you can learn more at the uh, at the Rust Rutgers Master Gardeners website, mgofmc.org. Uh, here is a list of native plant nurseries in Massachusetts and New England native plant seed companies in New England, uh, any, uh, uh, for, which will be great for your, um, uh, I, I recommend New England wetland plants, which is in South Hadley, uh, for those of us who live here in Western Massachusetts, uh, as a great uh, resource. Uh, I, I work at uh, Triple Brook Farm in Southampton. Uh, there are also a number of other uh, great um, uh, nurseries. There's uh, 
uh, again, New England wetland plants for, for uh, not only for seeds, but for uh, mature plants. Uh, Wing and a Prayer Nursery in uh, Cummington. Uh, that's a plenty farm in Hadley. They all have, uh, and they're, they're not, not only sources for plants and seeds, but they're resources of information. So if you have a, a shady area and you want to plant, you, you want to know what can grow there or a, a wet area or a dry area, or perhaps you have acidic soil or, or basic soil or whatever your conditions, uh, there'll be people there who know their plants quite well and be, would be able to help you make your selections. Uh, here's another source of expertise. Master gardeners uh, are, uh, have created a hort line at the Tower Hill Botanical Garden uh, towerhillbg.org. If you send, if, if you have a plant, you don't know what it is, you can send a, a photo for ID. And if you have a plant that's not doing, uh, that doesn't look healthy, uh, send them a photo and they might be able to diagnose and help you treat that, or, or help you problem solve what you need to do to get that plant to be healthy again. Uh, consider joining a garden club to learn uh, a lot and, and just for the fellowship of, uh, uh, and, and sharing that goes on, you know, sharing uh, and swapping your plants with other, other people. Uh, or befriend gardeners in your neighborhood and uh, share produce and, and expertise and plants. Um, and you could consider having the projects that you collaborate on and just celebrate uh, the wonders of nature together and celebrate com camaraderie as well. Uh, invite children to be stewards of nature when they have the uh, experience of uh, and the satisfaction of accomplishment uh, and the pride of, 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 that comes along with that kind of self-confidence, uh, and also giving them an opportunity to taste what real food uh, tastes like when, when you've grown it yourself. Uh, th 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 it's, it's all good. Uh, fostering love and respect for nature also will help uh, to uh, bring, uh, bring on the next uh, generation of people who will be uh, enth enthusiastic activists uh, protecting our environment. All decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. This is the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation, and it applies not only to uh, humans, but to, to the uh, plants and animals that cannot speak for themselves and whose needs we must also be uh, concerned uh, and considered about. There is no limit to what we can do together. Start where you are, and thank you for doing your part. Uh, I'm providing my email address here at the bottom of the slide, info at johnroot.net. I'd be happy to send you a list of the resources that I described in this presentation. Uh, and if you have any comments or questions, I'd be happy to attempt to, to respond and answer them. Well, thank you for uh, joining me and uh, um, happy gardening. Mm -hmm.